Howdy. In this chapter, we're going to be making several games. Um, but in order to make those games, we have to go over threads and collisions. Threads. A thread is a process that manages the execution of code. A program running a single thread can only perform one action at a time. All the programs we've made thus far. A program running multiple threads can perform multiple actions simultaneously. And the reason simultaneously is in quotes is because if you're working with a single processor, you can only do one thing at a time. So how the processor simulates doing multiple things at a time is by allowing one computer, one, one program or thread a very small amount of time with the processor. Then it will give somebody else a small amount of time with the processor. Then it will give somebody else a small amount of the a small amount of time with the processor. It'll keep rotating between all the programs or threads and giving each a little bit of time with the processor. So what appears to happen is it seems like the program's running everything simultaneously. Runnable interface. Runnable is an interface that has a single abstract method named run. A thread object can manage a runnable, runnable class so that, the, that its code is continually run concurrently with all other active threads. So in theory, your program could have four or five threads, and each thread would run concurrently with each other. So you could have your program simultaneously doing four or five things at a time. The thread class. When you create a thread object, it's thread, thread name equals new thread, and it receives a runnable object. When you're ready to start executing the code in your runnable objects run method, you say thread name.start. This calls the run method of the stored object. Example, class A equals a new class A. We assume that class A is a runnable. Thread T equals a new thread A. So we make a thread that manages this A object. And then we start it. This will invoke that class's run method. Don't worry, this will make a little bit more sense when we see some examples. Thread methods, we have start. It starts running the thread. It will call the run method of your runnable class. Static, void, sleep, int mills stops running the current thread for mills milliseconds. Pausing the current thread, aka this thread, whichever one's active at the time. Try thread.sleep time to pause in milliseconds curly brace catch exception e and we print error we we add an error sleeping and we also print the stack trace because stack traces are amazing so we want to see them all right we're going to do my threaded printing example it's pretty quick what i'm going to start by doing is looking at a class i wrote called public class b printer it implements runnable that means it will have a run method what it's going to do in its run method is it's going to try to print B. Don't worry, it's going to be successful. But when you do a sleep, it has to go in a try. So then we're going to wait one second, print B, wait one second, print B, wait one second. Now let's put one more B there. All right, let's look at another class I've written. C printer. Guess what? It prints C's to the screen. So it prints C, waits two seconds, C, waits two seconds, C, waits two seconds, C. All right, now we're going to look at our main file. What I do in my main file is I create a B printer called BP. I create a C printer called CP. Then I create a thread, thread BP, is a thread that manages BP. T underscore CP manages my CP object, my C printer. And then I print, uh, I start BP, I start CP. That's going to start invoking their run methods. But what's actually happening is there's a thread allocated to running that object, so it's going to run concurrently with any other threads our, uh, our program has. And by default, your program has one thread. So this program actually has three threads. It has the two that I made and the one that's allotted for main. So then I'm going to tell main to print a, sleep, a, sleep, a, sleep for half a second. So it's going to print lots of a's. So our thread in the main class, or the one that we're given by default that's hidden, is going to print a over and over and over. 
Our B printer will print B periodically, and our C printer will print C periodically. Now I'm going to demonstrate that all are running simultaneously. So when I run my program, it prints A, B, C, A, A, and it's not in the main method, I don't say A, A, sorry, I don't say A, B, C, A, B, C. What's actually happening is after, <clears throat> after the C thread has waited long enough, he will print a C every two seconds. B prints every second. Every half second, A prints. So they're all managing their own timers. Hey, I'm going to wait a little bit, do something, wait a little bit, do something. But they're happening simultaneously. Because that other file is doing something while this file is doing something. Well, not actually file. One, all three threads are doing something at the same time. They print something, wait, print something, wait, print something, wait. If they weren't doing it simultaneously, we would have gotten lots of Bs, then lots of Cs, then lots of As. But since they were happening simultaneously, we got to see combinations of them. All right, this is my thread printing example. Updates. An update is when the game moves items in the game world or changes values in the game. Updates per second is the number of times the game data changes every second. Many old computer games did not properly manage updates per second. When a program was run on a slow computer game, uh, sorry, when, uh, when the program was run on a slow computer, the game would run slow. When the game was on a, played on a very good computer, it would run so fast it would be unplayable. Games now are written, let me move my face, games are now written so that they update at the same speed on varying computers. Unfortunately if you have a really outdated computer games will still run slow on them. And some of you may think that your game is running slow when it only repaints uh, very slowly. The game might be moving at normal speed, but you just might not be seeing the game very often. And that's what we're going to cover on our next slide. Frames. A frame is a single image of the game's video. The frame rate, or frames per second, of a game is the average number of frames the game displays every second. A good frame rate is about 35 frames a second or more. A game may appear jumpy if it cannot maintain a good frame rate. And we're going to talk more about this on the next slide, I believe. Coding frames per second and updates per second. Having the correct updates per second will allow a game to run at the same speed on virtually any machine. We will code our program so that it always makes the correct number of updates per second. And usually, each update will result in the screen being repainted. You can update the game without repainting the screen. When we have to do multiple updates at a time, so maybe we're behind and we're not making the right number of updates per second, what we're going to do is we're going to update the game multiple times. What this means is if we update the game multiples of multiple, multiple times is that each update will not make it to the screen. So these, uh, so when you do not repaint after updating, uh, you might get something called a dropped frame. These are frames that are lost because the computer couldn't keep up with the drawing and updating. So if you can only, if you have to update and draw. Students, it is now 3 o'clock. If you're not with a sponsor, a coach, or attending a tutorial, exit the building at this time. Thank you and have a great day. When your computer is updating and drawing, it's important to make sure your game plays at a consistent speed. So updates take priority over drawing. This may mean that you skip drawing in order to keep your game updating at the right time. That may mean you could get a ridiculously low number of frames per second, like three or five, but your game would be playing at the right speed, but it wouldn't feel right. All right, in this video, I'm going to show you how to use a thread to continually update your game and redraw the screen. So here I create a new USB. PS, FPS frame, update per second, frame per second, frame. All right. I have a buffered image because, yeah, you need one of those. Um, I'm going for 50 updates a second, and I'm keeping track of how many updates have occurred since I've been playing. You'll see why I have that later. 
I have a box that moves back and forth across the screen. This is its X position, its Y position. It moves at 0.98 pixels per update. It goes uh, use for the box's direction, uh, Boolean left. When it's when left is true, it's going left. When it's not, it's going right. All right, we'll look through all this. And my class is runnable because my class is runnable. That means I can create a thread to manage it. That's why I say thread t equals new thread this. Now, so I have a thread managing the running of this frame. I do t.start, which invokes its run method, which we'll get to in a little bit. I'm going to show you my update real quick. Update. If the box x is bigger than 400, go left. When you get less than 50, go right. If you're going left, subtract. If you're going right, add. Paint, pretty basic. Draw it to the screen. We start off by calculating how many milliseconds we need to wait between each update. So we do 1,000, because that's how many milliseconds are in a second, divided by how many updates we want. So if we want 50 updates per second, then we're going to update every 20 milliseconds. Long start time equals system.nanotime. What this is for is getting the system's uh, computer time in nanoseconds. That way you can say, oh, this is when we started. Now in our loop, we're going to say, should I repaint? Nah. Current time is system.nanotime. We want to measure the, diff the distance between your start time and our current time. Long, update ne updates needed. This will calculate how many updates should have happened since our program started. That's going to be current time minus start time divided by 1 million. That'll turn the nanoseconds into milliseconds. Then we divide that by the number of milliseconds between each update. So this gives us how many updates should have happened since the program started running. Now we have long x equals update count. This is how many updates actually have happened since we started our program. If x is less than the number of updates that should have happened, we update and we say we should repaint because the game has changed its data so we should redraw the screen and we add one to our update count then we go x plus plus x less than updates needed we keep doing this we might if our paint takes a really long time if we have a whole lot of stuff going on the screen we may end up where in a, we may end up in a situation which we might have to update twice because we missed an update it is not acceptable to miss updates because your game will not play, on a consist, play at a consistent speed computer to computer. So if we normally do update paint, update paint, update paint, update paint, but paint's taking too long, then you might have done update paint, but when you finish painting and you come back around in your loop, you're like, oh my gosh, we need to do three updates instead of one. So you update the screen, so you update your game three times, then you see a paint. So you won't see a paint for every update. If you should repaint, repaint. Then you sleep a very small amount of time, five milliseconds. Then you start the whole process over again. Let's go ahead and look at this. All right, I got this box moving back and forth, and it's beautiful. Collision detection is a term for de it, collision detection is a term for determining when two items in a game are touching. If you're testing collision detection with circles, it's fairly easy. When the distance between the centers is less than or equal to the sum of the radii, they are touching, otherwise they are not. See here we have this radius and we have this radius. They are, the distance is greater than both the radii together, so they are not touching. Here the distance is less than the two radii, so the two circles are touching. For this, you're going to need the distance formula. D equals x sub 2 minus x sub 1 squared uh, plus y sub 2 minus y sub 1 squared, all under a radical or to the half power. Collision detection with two rectangles is a lot easier. Hey, those rectangles aren't touching. Hey, these rectangles are. 
You might be wondering what math equation or check do you need to do for it. You don't actually have to do any. It's pretty awesome. There is a class called rectangle, and when you make a rectangle, you give it an x, you give it a y, you give it a width, and you give it a height. Those would be the bounds of your image. And if you have a second rectangle, you can tell if the two rectangles are touching. So if all your graphical objects in the game have a rectangle that moves with them, to tell if two items are touching, all you have to do is rectangle one dot intersects rectangle two, or the other guy's rectangle. This is really amazing, and this is how we're going to do our collision detection in Java. Otherwise, it gets very complicated. All right, in this video, I'm going to show you how to use rectangles to tell if two objects are touching. We're going to start by looking at a class I made called Collidable. It has an X, a Y, and a rectangle. So when you construct a Collidable, you need to send it the X position, the Y position, and a rectangle. Then it has normal accessors and mutators. Get X, get Y, get rect, uh, set X, set Y, set rect, hit other. This is the important method. It receives another collidable. Then all you do is say, if my rectangle dot intersects the other rectangle, return true, else return false. All right, now let's look at a moving rect. A moving rectangle has variables for left, right, up, down. It has a direction which will store one of these public static finals, which is the direction the rectangle is traveling. It has a width, a height, a speed, and a color, because we're going to be drawing these rectangles to the screen. Let's look at moving rect. It's got an x, y. It receives everything and then sets all of its colors. Uh, sorry, sets all of its attributes. The first thing it does is say, hey, I'm going to be at this location, and here's my rectangle. Then it stores all the other data it received. It makes a random color, the color of the this moving rectangle. It has accessors, and it's got some mutators. It's also got a variable called bounce. If you tell a rectangle to bounce, if it's going left, it changes to right. If it's going right, it changes to left. If it's going up, it changes to down. If it's going down, it changes to up. When you tell a rectangle to update itself, it'll use the move to command. It moves to the location, x, minus its speed if it's going left. If you're going right, you add the speed to the x. If you're going up, you subtract the speed from the y. If you're going down, you add the speed to the y. And when you move, it's a combination of both setting your x and y and then correcting your rectangle. All right, now let's move over to the frame because we know what a rectangle is. What a frame does, it has an array list of rectangles. Here, I create several rectangles. I have them at static locations but they get a random speed and a random direction. Then I make a thread that starts my run method. My run method will continually call update and paint, just like in the previous example. All right. Public void update. We go through all the rectangles. First we store their old x and y. Then we tell them to move. Then we do the hit something method. We send the rectangle to see if it intersected anything else, like a wall or another rectangle. If it did intersect something, it bounces and then moves back to its old location. Let's look at how hit something works. We receive a rectangle. If my x is less than 0, I'm off the screen. If my x plus my width is greater than 500, I'm off the screen. Or my y is less than 0, or my y plus my height, is greater than or equal to 500, it's off the screen. Return true. I hit something. Otherwise, we have to check to see if we hit any other rectangles. And how we do that is we do a for loop to go through all the rectangles. If the address of MR is not the address of other, meaning they are different objects, and MR.hitOther is true, this is checking to see if this person hit something else, then we do other.bounce and return true. The reason we don't bounce ourselves is because that's going to happen when we return to true right here. And if we did not hit the wall or anything else, we return false. We didn't hit anything else. Let's go see how, oh, mr.hitother, that's the method that we wrote for um, collidable, hit other. Then I have my paints and I have my update just like last time, and let's see how this method the, how this project works. See, whenever they hit, they both bounce off of each other. 
and I'm just using rectangle collision. Now rectangle collision doesn't work quite as well when you have something that doesn't perfectly fill out the rectangle. And we'll get into that later, but for now we're just going to assume everything has a rectangle that bounds it well, and we can always check for rectangle collision. Alright, that's about it for this example.